So I'll give you a little boilerplate language while we're uh, getting ready. I'd have to buy my own lunch, but we can talk. I want to continue to thank everyone for coming this morning. And I want to once more advertise the report that Common Sense Media has prepared for the event. As we started working with Tim and the Congressional Internet Caucus, we found that it was really essential to, to gather some of the information from a parent's perspective, because our background as an organization is really mostly about what information do parents need to manage what their kids are doing with all media, and mobile is becoming an increasingly large part of it. And one of the things that we found as we started preparing this report, it, we, when we use this ter these terms really for the first time, you see in one of the pages that we looked at kind of the good news and the bad news, which are terms we don't usually use when we talk about media because we try to let that be a parent's decision. And we put, put out developmental advice about a given movie, a new video game, any of the things that kids might be doing so that parents and schools can make their own choices. But in this case, we really did want to outline that some of the things, and we talked about a few of them this morning, are a little more worrisome. Some of them that I think we'll talk about more in this second panel are more about the potential, the educational potential of mobile devices. So I want to thank everyone for coming, and I want to introduce Kevin from Digital Directions. Education Week. Digital Education Directions. Week to introduce the panel. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Uh, Thank you for uh, inviting me to moderate this panel. This is a topic that is near and dear to our hearts at, at Education Week. We've been reporting on it quite a bit recently. And there's been a lot of other reporting going on in the media about the use of mobile devices for education. And for instance, recently there was a, an article in Fast Company magazine that was very good and I would, I would highly recommend you, you get a copy if you can. It was, in, it was, it was published April 1st. And the, the, the headline for the article was, A is for app, how smartphones, handheld computers sparked in educational revolution. It's a very good article, but I would revise the headline a bit to say, A is for app, how smartphones, handheld computers are sparking in educational revolution. <laughs> because I'm not sure the mobile educational revolution is in full swing yet. I think it's still, I still, it's in a phase of sparks, and, and that's what we covered recently in an in a annual report we do about technology called Technology Counts, and it's titled Powering Up Mobile Learning Seeks the, K uh, uh, Seeks the Spotlight in K-12 Education. And we took a look at a lot of the issues, funding of mobile devices, how, how to develop curriculum to be used on mobile devices, best practices, some examples, for instance, of how uh, a, a project called Project Knect is using smartphones to teach math, another uh, project where they're using these mobile devices to teach reading. There's, there's a lot going on in this field right now, and it's very interesting. And I think that in the education world right now, I would say that the use of online course taking and the use of mobile devices are two of the most sort of ex uh, two of the two of the best examples of uh, of sort of disruptive innovation in education right now, and and that is going to push schools to do things differently than they have in the past. So I think this is a this is an area we're going to continue to cover both online and in print. And and technology counts is available online. If you would like to talk to me after about some of the work we're doing, please feel free to to come up after the panel is over. But let's get this started. Uh, uh, we have some great guests um, here today. We have Karen Cater, the Director of the Office of Educational Technology for the U.S. Department of Education. We have Dr. Kip Rogers, Principal of the Passage Middle School in Newport News, Virginia. And we have Jean Weller from the Office of Educational Technology with the Virginia Department of Education. To get this started, we're, uh, Karen is going to talk about the role of mobile computing in the National Education Technology Plan. So please uh, give Karen a hand. Good morning. If we were a classroom, I'd have all of you in the back move up to the front here and fill in the front seats, but we're not. So, um, you know, so just quick backdrop, I have uh, my Blackberry and my iPhone both, and uh, you know, so the whole role of, um, of mobile is totally taking over, I think, in the, um, in the business world and even through uh, many parts of government as well. So I think this kind of 24-7 connection um, 
is bigger than education, and so it's part of the becoming part of the backdrop that we uh, we have. So, just specifically talking about education, um, the I'm going to talk about two things fairly quickly, and um, to do with the National Education Technology Plan. The first part is the context that it's it's within, and the second part is about the actual content, how we thought about technology in in 2010, and what is the role of technology in supporting student learning. So um, the backdrop, first of all, is President Obama's high goal of saying by the year 2020 we will be the uh, we will have the highest per capita uh, graduation rate um, in the world. Okay, so that's the first thing. Right now we're about 39 percent. That means we'll get to about 60 percent. So that's a high goal. That means we're getting way more students over a way higher bar, and not by making college easier. So the second goal is that we'll close the achievement gap. And so that holds some uh, special, uh, special parts to the conversation. How do we think about equity? How do we think about um, students in underserved areas? Um, and mobile could potentially help us with some of that. So the other part of the context, it's what's happening with the technology world. So first of all, mobile, 24-7 access. The entire first panel is all about that, so we don't need to talk more about that. But I will say that, that it's, it, you need to think about it in the context of a social backdrop, right? The social interactions that people have now, whether they're online and going online and, and learning new things, or whether they're with their mobile devices, much of it is all about social interaction. So it's kind of like a lot of it has to do with new media, same behaviors, right? So it's kind of... Um, elevates our abilities to do these things. The second part, so mobility is one, the second part is the proliferation of digital content. And digital content can be all the things from the MIT physics professor lecturing about physics and you know having 70,000 people across the world downloading it to the student um, producing a video or something that, that demonstrates their learning um, to the highly produced and professional uh, content that's produced by PBS and NOAA and NASA and the National Science Digital Library and the National Archives. I was at a meeting last week and at the end of the meeting they were all presenting all the different kinds of content they're producing. And I was thinking it's a great time to be a student. <laughs> so much to learn, so much cool and very compelling and interesting content. But we do have a disconnect between the, the proliferation of digital content and then kind of what's available in our schools. The third is the social interactions for learning. So when you think about when people wake up in the morning and they need to learn something new, if you need to cook, if you need to fix a faucet, if you need to, you know, if you're knitting or something like that, there's a social network for you. Where can you go to find people with, with like interests, you know, photography? There are websites for all of these things, and it's not just giving you information, it's all about the interaction. Who are the experts? Who do you talk to? Who do, who do you contact? Etc. So the social interactions for learning are, are pretty interesting. And then the fourth kind of trend line, so we got mobile, proliferation of digital content, increase in social interactions for learning, all sorts of things. And then the fourth is that I really see um, that we will be moving from a very print-based education space with textbooks predominantly, moving to an online environment, right? So as we move from a very print-based space to digital and online, it really provides an entirely new opportunity to connect and to leverage the, the variety of devices, whether they're computers in the classroom, computers you know, in your desk, computers in your pocket, you know, at home, wherever. So those are kind of the four quick trends, and we can talk more about those if they're useful. So the National Education Technology Plan was, was created with that as a backdrop. We said, okay, what's going on in the world today? How do we think about this? So there are five parts to the National Education Technology Plan and then a bonus section, okay? <laughs> so the five parts. The first part is about learning. It's absolutely the biggest, the core, the, the focal point. The title of the plan is Transforming American Education, Learning Powered by Technology. So it's definitely focused on learning. How do people learn today? It's grounded in learning sciences. What's the role of engagement and motivation in learning? What is the role of uh, prior experience, prior knowledge? How do we create very personalized learning environments? And again, back to the big goal of getting more students over a higher bar, we need to create the most engaging, compelling, interesting, deep um, learning experiences for students every single day. We need to make sure we're doing things that are relevant to them, that, that speak to them, that help them get over the next, the next hurdle that help them come back to school after lunch. 
So the learning part is also about levering te leveraging technologies um, in terms of thinking about the universal design for learning and kind of all students, regardless of ability, dip disability, learning preference, learning styles, et cetera, technology can help us meet the needs of way more students. So the, you know, a great example of this is if you have text on a screen, you can have it read to you, right? So that was created and the, the, way, the reason those technologies came about were for people who are blind. Well, it turns out that that same technology is great for first year medical students who are reading new content or people who are, are um, learning English or emerging reader, readers or all sorts of things. So that techno these technologies, and that's just one example of a plethora of technologies that have been designed for people who have disabilities and, and need certain things these things actually are great for all students. So the learning section is, com is grounded in all that and more. The last thing about the learning section I wanna say is that it's also grounded in 24-7. How do we connect informal learning with formal learning so that all students can learn whether they're sitting in the school classroom, on the bus, at home, trying to do homework, at the community center, with their tutor, you know, wherever they are, how can we build these learning environments? And obviously mobility has a, a lot to do with that. So that's the learning section, the biggest, most, co co the most important part of the entire plan. Second part is about assessment. And the assessments support learning. The assessments, how do we create assessments that are embedded in the learning activities all day long, you know, so that we aren't so dependent on these big tests that swoop in and kind of drop down, everybody stops, does that, and they swoop out again. Right, so how do we create these assessments embedded in learning experiences so that we know every single day, not just how students are doing, but what do we do next as a result of the assessment. So kind of the whole continuous improvement. The other part I'll say about assessment is measuring what matters, measuring the full range of the standards. Right, so if, if we have things like speaking and listening, if we have critical thinking, problem solving, um, global um, understanding, these kinds of things that we articulate in standards to say these are things that are important for kids to learn. How do we create assessments, and we can use technology to do this, that actually are capable of helping us understand how students are doing across the range of all of those things that kind of make up 21st century expertise. So that's the assessment section. Teaching, 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 teachers, what do we do, right? And we all say, Teachers need to get up to speed. We need to do a lot of professional development. What we came across with when we really thought long and hard and did lots of research, talked to people, got input, feedback, we came upon this notion of the highly connected teacher. And in order to, number one, inspire new people to come into the, learn, to the teaching profession and to totally empower those people who are in the teaching profession, we need to create the highly connected teacher. They need to be connected to the data so they know what to do next connected to the content and the resources so they actually can, can help, can have the things uh, that are appropriate for each and every student. They need to be connected to experts, maybe back to their college of education or whoever the expert is that can help them meet the needs of this student in their classroom that they've never seen this particular you know, issue before. So the highly connected teacher is connected to data, content, resources, experts, uh, communities of practice that really help them be highly effective. The other part of highly connected teaching happens to be what, how we think about our underserved areas, maybe very rural areas or, um, or places where they may not have the, most of, the, mo the best uh, qualified teacher, but how do we now take the environment that those, the teacher, the, the student is in, uh, connect them with online courses, and maybe the person locally is helping them access the experts in Mandarin or physics or algebra or whatever the content area is. So that's the other part of the teaching, helping every single student have access to highly effective teaching. The fourth part then is about infrastructure. And uh, for this, we really stood on the shoulders of the, the giant uh, FCC broadband plan. They really um, you know, kind of did the entire swath of how do we think about build out of broadband throughout the entire country to every corner. So broadband is incredibly important. It's incredibly important for our anchor institutions and in making sure that our, our schools, for example, in this case, have, act, have the, the best bandwidth possible. And then also ensuring that homes, community centers, and other places community-wide that students may want to get online, access information, do their homework, um, access their own experts, um, et cetera. How do, we, how do we build that out? 
And so the other part of that then, if we have broadband build out, is utilization of that. And for utilization, we need devices. We need the, the devices, whether they be mobile devices or computers, we need devices in the hands of every student and teacher 24-7 so they can do their work. And then finally, the, um, so the learning section, the assessment section, the teaching section, very connected, providing this, this vision of a, of a, of a the kind of a learning powered by technology. The infrastructure really enables that. And then the final part is on productivity. And this is to say, again, if we're going to get way more students over a way higher bar, how do we think about building more effective, um, uh, productive uh, methodologies so that each and every day, students are doing the things that are the, the best thing for them to be doing. Rather than saying, you know, it's September 24th and you're in fourth grade and you're in my classroom, that, might, that must mean today is two-digit multiplication regardless, right? So how do we think about that? And that's obviously a complete overstatement. But, um, but we can use technology to ensure that we are, have a way more productive way of doing business. Um, we had the comment about online courses earlier, and we're definitely thinking that online courses are another way of creating a, a more effective and efficient way of um, providing students access. And I will say that all of the conversation that we're having about, about online courses, about personalizing learning, all of this is in a very participatory context. So it's not thinking everybody just needs to get on their computer and do their own thing at their own time. It's very interactive. Learning is an interactive sport, so to speak, and so we need to create those interactions. And what we're seeing with online courses is they're becoming more interactive. So that's the context of the tech plan. The very last kind of bonus section is about research and development. It asks the big question, so what needs to be invented to make all this happen? And there are some grand challenges articulated, the kinds of things that we do need, we do need to have invented. We need to incent the industry to create the new and better um, methodologies. I will say one last thing, and then I'll stop and, and turn it over to our panel. The, um, and that is that I, one of the things I think is that we need to pick up the pace a little bit, right? Because if we think about um, the rate of change with technology and the, the, the regulatory backdrop and the, the kinds of things we're trying to do, we need to figure out ways of kind of picking up the pace a little bit and, and, and um, building understanding and, and building on, um, on situations that help the adults in the kids, in the students' world um, be as helpful and uh, connected and uh, uh, intelligent about what they're doing as possible. So with that, I'll stop and turn it back over to our moderator. Thanks. I'm going to step up here for a second because I want to do a little reboot on my introductions because I left out a very important member of our panel down on the end, Liz Karen Kolb, the author of Toys to Tools, Connecting Student Cell Phones to Education. I, I apologize for, Lee, for not introducing you, Liz, but um, why don't we start with a question from you to begin with. Um, in your book, you talk about the digital disconnect between the way students use technology and particularly mobile devices uh, in their personal lives versus how they use mobile devices and other technologies in school. What, what is the digital disconnect and you know, why is it such a problem and how can schools go about changing it or, or, or you know, shortening the gap? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's, there's actually multiple disconnects that are happening in the schools with technology. The most obvious is what Kevin was, was mentioning and what we've heard from the first panel, which is that our students are, are walking around every day with these kind of appendages with them of uh, mobile devices and social networking and video games and, and all sorts of array of technologies they're using every day to socialize and to interact and to network and collaborate and communicate. But, when they walk into the school building, overwhelmingly they're told no, stop, put them away, put them down, keep them at home, we don't want them here, take out a, a pencil and a piece of paper and let's start working. And so that's the immediate disconnect that they have is that the technology they use every day, as soon as they walk outside of school, they have to power down as soon as they walk inside of school. Um, and they're given a message that it's negative, that it's harmful, that it's distracting to their education. Um, at, at, at the same time, what's interesting to me is um, I'm at the University of Michigan and I did a big research study on um, new teachers coming in uh, to teaching and I asked them what they do in their daily lives, what technology tools they use. 
overwhelmingly they're using the same tools their students are using. I mean, these are young 20-something uh, teachers. They're, they're social networking. They're using their cell phones. They're texting. Um, they're doing all of this. They're playing video games. Uh, but when you ask them if they see using those technologies in their teaching, overwhelmingly they say, no, no way would I use it. Um, and when you ask them, well, why not, they say, because that's not how I was taught. And so they see teaching um, uh, the way that they were taught as a student. And they didn't see any of these tools being used in teaching, so immediately they see them as something they shouldn't be using in teaching. So it's a very difficult thing to kind of penetrate uh, that particular uh, viewpoint that teachers have of teaching, uh, that there are certain tools that are acceptable and there are certain tools that are not acceptable. Um, the other uh, issue we have around that is that there are some technologies that are acceptable in schools to use mostly educational software, hardware that's made specifically for the classroom. There's, there's so much software out there that's made just for teaching students how to learn about um, uh, flora and fauna or teaching them how to learn their ABCs or teaching them uh, you know, how, about history and timelines and making those. You don't see any of those tools being brought outside of the school. So students walk into the school, they're told to power down all of your toys you use every day or your tools and open up this piece of software. We'll teach you how to use Timeliner or whatever the software is. You learn how to use it. You can't take that home because you don't have that at home. So when you leave school and you leave the classroom, you no longer have access to that tool that you've been learning the content on. Um, so the students leave the school, they leave the classroom, and they power up their other tools, and then there's this disconnect between the technology they're using in school and the technology that they're using um, in their everyday lives. So that's another complexity that we have um, with that. And so the question is, can we take what they're using in their everyday lives that they have access to and bring it into the schools so it becomes a very fluid thing for the students. So it's no longer this is outside of school, this is inside of school, uh, especially the technology tools that not only students are using but society values now. Um, citizenship is, is mobile, uh, 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 jobs are becoming much more mobile, uh, and these students are going to have to know how to use their devices to interact and network in a professional manner, in an educative manner. Uh, productively and not just um, as a way to socialize. And that's something we're not doing in schools. Um, and, and there's some reasons for that. Um, one of the obvious reasons is that there's a certain fear that teachers have about using these tools in schools that they've never seen used before. They have no models of it. Nobody's telling them it's okay to use. As a matter of fact, when I tell my student teachers to try using cell phones in their classroom, many of them are told no by their cooperating teachers and by the school administration that they are not allowed to even try it or experiment with it. Um, in the school system. So they're really given a very negative message about it, so there's a certain fear of their own you know, livelihood, their job, um, that they don't want to try it. Um, the other fear is that they just don't know how to do it. They have no uh, idea of how do I take a cell phone with text messaging and connect it with curricula. Um, so that's the other uh, hurdle that we need to get through um, with the teachers is, is how do we get through that particular disconnect as well. Now one last thing I do want to say, is that um, there, uh, the speak up reports that, that come out every few years, um, the latest speak up report that just came out, the number one request by students um, in grades K through 12, the number one request is they want to use their mobile devices, they want to use their cell phones in school, um, and uh, they would like to use it for learning activities. Um, so the students themselves are saying, we want to try this, we, we want to do this, we use it outside of school, we have access to it all the time, why can't we, we start doing this? And so I think our challenge is um, to try to really find ways to develop professionals who have a spectrum of technologies that include whatever the students are doing um, in their everyday lives. And right now, obviously, cell phones and texting but I also think that um, that will change over time and we need to, as schools and teachers, be able to adapt with the new technology. Kip, maybe you can uh, talk about what your, what your school has done with cell phones and other mobile devices. Sure. Uh, currently, we're in our third year. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, being, having an opportunity to come and share about something I'm very passionate about and that is using technology for the purpose of enhancing instruction. In any event, at our school, we, this is our third year using cell phones uh, throughout the course of the school day and in several different classes. And I started as a principal uh, kind of by accident uh, taking 
over a seventh grade pre-algebra class of a pretty um, robust bunch of 12 and 13 year old <laughs> students uh, at the end of the day after lunch. And if either of you, how many of you guys have middle school kids at home maybe? So you kind of know how they can kind of be. In any event, um, <laughs> we were testing uh, with the quarterly assessment test to determine, it's a formative test to see what kids knew. Uh, that way I could monitor uh, my instruction. And we were short with calculators. And I think I needed three or four of them. I had a cell phone at the time, I had a palm trio, and I uh, told one of the kids to use my calculator uh, for the test. And I never forget the look on his face. He looked at me, you know, very oddly and said, uh, Dr. Rogers, I didn't know cell phones had calculators uh, on them, so I just had an aha moment, and I asked, I think there were 22 kids in the class, how many of you guys own cell phones, and I think about 16 of them raised their hands, um, and just kind of click, I told them to go get them. How many of you guys have them here? I think of the 16, maybe 12 of them had them uh, in their lockers, and, uh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> and they ran and got them, and I let them use their calculators for uh, the test at the time, and they were kind of very apprehensive about it. Is it okay for us to do this? Uh, yeah, I'm the principal, it's okay <laughs> for them to do that. And I had them hooked from that point in time, and we started doing phone Fridays. And I, at the time, you know, as I reflect on how things are so different just in a short period of time, the focus was primarily on the cell phone as the medium. And right now, because I have so many teachers that have, are incorporating cell phones in the classroom, the cell phone is so not the focus of the instruction, it, it enhances good instruction. So we have a mindset that, I guess an analogy would be, the cell phone is not the main actor in the play, it's a supporting actor of good instruction, which is very refreshing. But our teachers have come to you, and I started, and I told the kids, you know, we're doing it on Fridays, don't tell anybody. That lasted about two days before it kind of got out, and then everybody kind of wanted to do it. And I was very guarded with it because I was experimenting, because I too, had the preconceived notion that cell phones are not a good thing to have in school, you have to turn them off. We have a policy in our school division where kids can have them in middle school, but they have to be turned off and stowed in their locker. Uh, in any event, we started off very kind of, kind of slowly and just kind of simply using the calculator, quite honestly, because that was the easiest function for them to do. And of course, every Friday, kids would come to me and say, Dr. Rogers, we can use the camera to take pictures of our homework and send them to so-and-so-and-so -and -so when she's absent from school or text them to so-and-so-and-so. -and -so. We can text them homework so that when they get back, they don't have to ask you, uh, you know, what's the homework or be missing it. They would come every week with different stuff to uh, have me do. And so I found myself have, as a principal and teaching having to do research. And at the time, um, you know, it was a lot to do, but I was excited about it. And they fed off my, I fed off their excitement, quite frankly. And that's when I found uh, Liz Cole. Uh, and she has just done a lot of research on using the cell phones in the classroom. I'm just amazed at some of the simple things, and it doesn't have to be elaborate. And what's more, I have some teachers that are using them, but are not using them in the classroom. They're using them as part of homework. So the kids don't actually use the cell phones in the classroom, but they use them outside the classroom as part of homework assignments. And her participation in homework has gone up increased by a tremendous amount in terms of getting the kids to do it frequently. Um, in any event, we have teachers that are, again, using the calculators quite often. They use the, calcul the calendar function as an agenda book. One of the first things that got cut from our budget uh, was agendas. We provide agendas for all in our school division for all at the time, I think 32,000 students. Uh, that was the first thing that got slashed, and some of my teachers came up with, you know, the kids can use their calculator, the calendar function on their cell phones to record homework assignments, especially long-term projects. They can set alarms for them, so they use those. Of course, there's the uh, camera function and the video camera function. That does require um, SMS text messaging or MMS text messaging plans, and all students don't have them, but what kids have found out uh, to do is that if my cell phone has Bluetooth, cap Bluetooth capabilities, I can Bluetooth you a picture and then you can MMS that picture message to a blog or something like that that the teacher is housing. Of course, they use SMS text messaging. That's probably, you can come in any day and see our teachers, the, I think the 12 teachers that use them quite regularly, are using a service called uh, PollEverywhere.com, uh, which is kind of like a clicker deal or polling system. And they use it two ways. One. Uh, is for uh, entrance tickets in order to assess what kids learned the day before. And you can also 
often see them using them as exit tickets to assess the learning that took place during that day. Uh, my English teachers are probably the most creative with it. Uh, there's another function, it's a pretext free text function where uh, kids can text in uh, whatever the case may be, a, a sentence or what have you, but they use it to assist with reading as well as with writing, mm -hmm. which is extremely powerful. One of the, my favorite things to see teachers using is a, a strat strategy called DRTA, <laughs> which as they're reading a text, um, kids can kind of communicate uh, questions, and they do so without um, talking to uh, the neighbor next to them, but they're able to communicate pretty much with everybody in the class without communicating with everybody cl in the class. And what's really nice about it is it blurs the line between students that are very outspoken and students that are kind of shy, and it gives them a voice. So that's really powerful. The other thing that they use it for uh, is Google SMS, uh, text messaging. We have, well, our student population is about um, on paper, it's about 56, 57 percent of students that will qualify for free or reduced lunch. I think it's a little higher than that, but I think the pride factor kind of takes uh, in, in effect of that. And lots of our students don't have dictionaries at home, but they have cell phones. So we've taught them to use Google uh, as a means of dictionaries, so which increases their vocabulary. And especially with the homework assignments, which I hate when teachers give kids a list of vocabulary words to kind of go on home and look them up, uh, they make it very creative with uh, using Google SMS text messaging and the kids do participate with that a lot. And then there's a course uh, this year, and it's amazing how the conversation has transformed or shifted from last year in terms of just kind of doing rote stuff. And we're getting more of the social networking kind of thing because the kids love to write, they love to uh, blog, and um, they're using the cell phones to blog uh, to a service called Blogger, uh, which allows mobile uh, blogging capabilities from a phone, and each kid uh, has their own kind of page that's a spinoff from a teacher page, which is nice. So they're able to have pretty much a running record from the time of September through, like now you can kind of see the kids writing progress. And they find out some pretty uh, nifty ways of expanding what they're able to post. Like I had a kid told me last year that, I, you know, typically with an SMX text, a regular text, me text message, you can only send between 140 to 160 characters, but one of the kids told me, Dr. Rogers, if you, you send a text message as an MMS, picture message, you can get 1,000 characters. So kids are able to create, you, you can't, I didn't know that, did you? I mean, I didn't to, know that. So you can, you, they, they told, you can send 1,000 uh, characters as a picture message, which uh, lets kids Mm -hmm. um, write more, pretty much write more. So that's been a, a terrific aha moment for us. And then, of course, um, we focus a lot on uh, writing skills and um, reading skills. Our science teachers probably use the calculator and the stopwatch function quite frequently. I have a uh, PE teacher that uses the stopwatch function to time kids with different things. I had a student teacher, a music student teacher, who used the uh, voice recorder function to have kids record their playing of different musical pieces and then they would critique it. And that's the, the really neat thing about it this year. They're getting more into to kids creating products mm -hmm. and then having each other give feedback on it. And that is the probably the most powerful part of the learning. Uh, that's taking place Kip, we'll, we'll right get into more that's some right. more of this detail later I'm on, sorry. but no, it's okay. That's great. That's really good examples, and I think that one of the things we've seen in our reporting is that a lot of the the change is happening from the grassroots level, from the school and the district level up, and that's why I want to ask Jean, what do you see as the state's role in supporting the use of mobile devices for learning? Well, there's the role that we'd love to be able to take, and that is um, the monetary support for uh, things like this happening and, and finding ways to um, help the schools, help the students. There's a lot of, um, uh, and, and some of this came out in the first panel, there's a lot of question, how do you handle kid-owned devices versus school-owned devices? and and what are the rules, the COPPA, how does that play into effect? Uh, um, and, and we've really got to, to wrangle with some of those issues. So that brings me to really the big, sec the big biggest role that we do play, and that's looking at um, the, the policy issues that we have to deal with. Um, we have been running several pilot projects in Virginia, very small pilot projects, um, 
they go under a, a banner called Learning Without Boundaries. And the idea is that we want to try out different ways, different scenarios, um, different types of uh, approaches to mobile learning so that we can find out what are the implications, what are the, the barriers, how can we get over them. And I just loved hearing about how the kids were the ones who came up with the solutions to a lot of the barriers. And that's something that we often forget is that those kids are so smart. They can, we worry so much about that. And yet we need to learn, give some faith to those kids to come up with some of the solutions. Um, anyway, we, ha are, we have, do have several pr pilot projects. Several of them started uh, about a year and a half ago, and we have some results from those studies, some things that informed us. And now we're getting ready to go to a second round of pilots to try out some new things, as well as to test some of the ideas that came out of the original pilot projects and see how they go. So that, that really, we see that as our role. Um, our partners with these projects are school divisions, universities, and we, we let them worry about the, the things that Liz deals with, how, you know, and Kip deals with. How do we use these in a good educational way? And what we try to do is look at the, the ways that we can enable these things to happen by facilitating policy changes, um, figuring ways to talk to parents and other stakeholders in education to help them learn the value of mobile learning and those sorts of things. Yeah, and I want to follow up on something you, you mentioned, and it, and it raises a big picture issue, and that's the whole um, question of equity versus innovation. So, mm -hmm. so you're trying to innovate and you're using new technological tools like smartphones and such, but not everybody has a smartphone. And you know, who's going to provide it? How, how do you find that balance? How do you achieve that balance over time? Uh, because that was an issue that came up a lot in our reporting for technology counts. And it seems like the question is a very difficult one to answer. And, and again, Kip's, Kip's uh, student came up with the idea, well, I don't have the ability to send photos, but oh, I can do this to, to make that happen. Um, so sometimes we create those barriers and we worry so much about equity and forget that sometimes there can be solutions out there. They're not optimum solutions, perhaps. It would be wonderful to be able to just give every child, you know, uh, a mobile device that had all kinds of wonderful things built into it, that's probably not going to happen. So how can we, can we make this happen? I think it has to be slow. I think we've talked about that before. You have to kind of build up to it a little bit slow. Um, and uh, like, like we've been doing with our pilot projects is we've been kind of playing here and there. What, what can work? because certainly in a lot of our pilot projects, not every student has a device. K Karen, what do you see as the you know, federal government's role in, in sort of finding that balance? Well, I think though, I, I mean, a couple things. First of all, I think we're gonna find that it's going to be like a pencil, right? So, you know, you need, you will need technology to do your work. If you, it's, a it's 2010, it is a knowledge industry and it is, you know, we need technology to do research, to, f to find information, to interact with people. I mean, just, we could go on and on and on, not to even mention the affordances that it allows for increasing the achievement of students just on an everyday basis, you know. Anyway, we could go on about that, but I don't, we don't want to talk about that. So I think that it's going to become not a, like, a nice to have, but a must have. So to that end, I think I was, I loved what Kip said just because um, what's interesting is he did something interesting. He said, huh, how many people have them already? Let's start there. Let's leverage what you have rather than shutting them down at the door. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that, that is interesting that you know, sort of started thinking about a little bit is, is it possible to create a kind of free and reduced lunch program-ish scenario with devices? so that we can ensure that all students have devices, but rather than starting with a blank slate, could we leverage what students already have? And I think as we begin to articulate and, sh and use research and use really strong models of what's possible, 
then I think we'll have parents that will um, appreciate this kind of for the for the betterment of the education system. If the technology keeps those kids busy so they don't bug these kids over here so that they're actually all doing you know, focused work every single day. Um, these are the kinds of things that we really do need to do. I mean, I can't, I could not imagine walking into an eighth grade class today and trying to teach eighth graders with no technology. I can't even, I can't even, I don't know what that would be. Anyway, so, so that's one thing. The second thing I'll say is that I think our funding, our funding mechanisms will evolve. And they may evolve quickly, it may take a little more time. But right now we have separate buckets for all these different things. And what we're looking at at a federal level is the consolidation of, of funding streams so that people talk to each other about meeting their goals. Right now we have technology funding over there, we have assessment and, and the high stakes assessment stuff over here, we have textbooks over here. And you know maybe they talk to each other, maybe they don't, but they're definitely different funding streams. As we pull those things together, we say, Here's the technology platform, and by the way, all your digital, your content, your textbooks, your supplemental materials, your assessments, all of these things, your tools, your resources, your internet, your information will all flow through that platform. Then it becomes a consolidated model, and it's a, it's, and the funding then will follow that model. So I don't think we're that, I don't, that's not exactly rocket science. I think we can probably figure that out hopefully sooner rather than later for the sake of those eighth graders and their teachers. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to, uh, um, talk a little bit about the learning specifically. The title of this panel is Will Mobile Technology Transform Learning or Destroy It? Um, <laughs> and and, and the, there are a, a, quite a few critics out there who still believe that you know, using mobile devices is going to make learning more superficial. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't add to what the depth of what the kids are learning. It's disruptive, it's distracting, etc. Can you sort of talk about whether you agree or disagree with that and, and you know, give some examples of how use of mobile devices leads to more in-depth learning rather than more you know, superficial learning? Liz, you want to start with that? Sure. Um, and, and kind of to piggyback off of the last question that you had, um, I believe exactly what KIPP is doing is what other teachers are starting to do, which is they're going to the lowest common denominator in their school. Mm -hmm. I'm in I'm the Detroit public school system, for example, most of those children do not have internet at home. Um, but if you ask them how many of you have a cell phone, almost every hand will go up. And so teachers, they don't have a smartphone, they don't have an iPhone, but they have a cell phone with text messaging. And so teachers are taking advantage of whatever the students have within that, kind of a bring your own technology type model. Um, and as far as learning goes and, and getting to, the, to that, um, I do think we do a lot of things in education with technology that are gimmicky and not really attached to learning. You know, putting animations in a PowerPoint really doesn't have a whole lot to do with curricula and learning. <laughs> it might get their attention for a minute. Um, but I think it's very different with um, cell phones, and I'm sure Kip can speak more to this as well. Um, it really is able to extend learning, and I think that's such a powerful thing that we haven't had with education technology before. We can't take a smart board and take it home with us, um, but we have this powerful thing in our pocket every day, all day long. So when we're in the classroom and we're learning about, um, uh, we're studying leaves and biology, students can walk outside of the classroom, and this is definitely happening in classrooms in Detroit, and they can take pictures of different leaves that they see. They can send it into their interactive map on flagger.com where they can post the exact location that they found that leaf. And then they can actually use Google SMS to, to do some research to find out why is that particular maple leaf found in that particular location um, and then they can blog about it and they can do all of that for homework outside of school and when they come back into school they have all this rich data of all these different leaves that the students have collected and all the teacher has to do is open up that flagger.com map and look at all the leaves and then they can start to analyze and synthesize and so it really is a powerful data collection tool but it also can help you to do research and compare and contrast and all those higher order thinking skills that we want students to be able to do. It's still just a tool, but it's a tool that can really um, help to kind of to, to get us to that point. And one thing I want to add is that with assessment, um, there are some schools in New Zealand that are now allowing students to use their cell phones um, and actually any technology device that they have on all of their exams and tests because they're saying the world is collaborative and networked and you need to know 
the questions to ask on a cell phone, the people to go to in order to get the answers. It's not so important that you memorize the preamble to the Constitution anymore, but rather it's to know who to go to to find out the information. So it's kind of inspiring as well. Kip, do you want to? I, I agree totally with Dr. Cole. Uh, when, since this is our, th our third year, and initially when I did it, I, it kind of, I guess you could kind of think it was kind of gimmicky, but because I'm an advocate for instruction, um, the teachers that I brought along was we brainstormed how can we make this not this year's new uh, toy. I mean, because all of our classrooms have smart boards, and some of the time they're not used so smart. But with the cell phone, we, we kind of focus on uh, three uh, research based instructional strategies that's summarizing, note taking, comparing, and contrasting, which is uh, from Marzano's work. And we design things that are centered. Uh, around that and we also focus on uh, getting kids to think when they're doing activities that involve the cell phones uh, with an instructional activity and what I mean by thinking just as Liz said uh, if you're concerned about kids cheating with the cell phone then don't design your test so that it makes it easy or to cheat with them design your test so that <laughs> it helps kids think and if they can use their cell phones to uh, to think then so be it. One of the things, activities that I do when I do uh, presentations with uh, educators to, to show them different ways that they can use uh, the cell phones, I give them a very simple activity. List as many songs as you can that are related to phones. And a prize goes to the person that uh, gets the most. Well, most of the people, the adults that I do this activity with, they have smartphones. And they're just writing down, trying to remember, and I play a little song music and stuff like that. <laughs> and then you may get one or two out of 50 that'll think, hey, let me go to the internet and type Google phone songs and get a plethora of stuff. But that is the first thing that every kid will do that has a smartphone in their hand. You teach kids how to think. So do I think that uh, the learning is superficial in terms of mobile learning? Absolutely not. It's superficial for adults that are not accustomed to it, but for kids that use mobile technology all the time, every day, it's not. And if you need help uh, finding ways to make it not super bad, kids will tell you, it's, this is dumb. They'll tell you, why don't we try it this way? Uh, they'll tell you, absolutely. So, yeah, and I think that, that speaks to the fact that um, kids, we learn differently from what the kids are learning today. And, mm -hmm. and so we value memorization skills. Sure. You know, oh yeah, oh, let's see, how many can I remember? How many songs can I remember out of my head as opposed to, uh, yeah, let me go find it. Because that's really, that's really a skill that the kids are used to having. Um, but one thing also I wanted to point out is um, it's really important to put an emphasis not on just what we learn, but also on how we learn, because how we learn informs a lot of, of what we do later on in life. So the um, ability to use the, the cell phones, the mobile devices to learn gives them a skill beyond just the content of what we're learning. Did you want to add something? Else? Actually, just one quick sentence. The, I think the bottom line here that everybody's saying is it's not about the tech, it's not about you how to use technology and is it superficial or not. It's getting every single teacher to create the most compelling assignments possible. Now we have about 15 or 20 minutes left. I'd really like to, uh, you know, get some questions from the audience and turn this into a little bit more of an interactive discussion with the audience. So uh, please come up and ask your questions. Uh, good morning. I'm Lucy Getman, National School Boards Association. And first of all, I want to thank Karen Cater for coming to our national conference in Chicago oh, last you. week. We appreciated your presentation very much. And also, um, just want to throw out my question from the earlier panel, which is um, how do schools effectively optimize the opportunities represented with this education technology by balancing student safety and school climate concerns with the unlimited potential to transform learning? I guess that question is kind of for me, maybe. And I heard you ask that question. I was sitting in the back, and I just kind of wanted to jump up. This is how we do it. It's not the, you know, it's not the end all, be all. It's just how we do it. We spend a lot of time talking about digital literacy and digital safety a lot before kids even can even bring them in the classroom. We start by doing an informal survey, and we send a survey home because more often than not, kids don't know their cell phone plans. They may think they have unlimited cell phone. Um, text messaging, <laughs> but they, sometimes they don't. They make it, you know, five or six hundred um, per month, 
And there was another question that was asked earlier, is there an implementation uh, curve in, in reference to age? I have a 13-year-old son who's in eighth grade who discovered girls around Christmas time, November, and he ran up like a $300 cell phone bill because he had a girlfriend that, who was not in our circle or whatever the case would be. And as much as I use cell phones and talk about them, I was not savvy enough to kind of key in on that and check to see who's in on that. So we don't know. So we spend a lot of time talking to kids about what they have access to and what they have permission to use in the classroom. We don't let kids talk on the phone. We, don't, we just don't do those activities in school. We give that as an option to do outside of school. Um, but you'd be surprised at how many parents just don't know their, well, they don't know their plans, much less what the kids have. Uh, so just creating awareness with that. Also, we teach them uh, about digital footprints and you know anything that can plug into a wall can be traced back to you so make mm -hmm. sure that you are doing things uh, decent and in order when when using those things so we kind of put the fear of God in them before we even use them and that's pr probably for our own uh, comfort more so than it is for kids comfort because once you set expectations for kids and reference they're going to be excited about using the technology and more often than not they're not going to jeopardize the uh, possibility of not being able to use that if from doing something inappropriate. The other thing that we do at my school, and probably because I guess I'm the principal, I like to focus on the uh, the misbehavior and not necessarily technology. If a kid is cheating with the cell phone, I don't think that you take the cell phone. You punish you for cheating. This is the consequence. Yeah. If a kid cheats with pen and paper, you know, I say, give me the pen and paper. You can't use that anymore. <laughs> you know, you just don't do that. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Um, with that, and I do have a great support from our central administrative office staff uh, with doing that. So we just spend a lot of time uh, with that. We create norms with the with the class and um, create an acceptable use policy. We kind of already have it written, written, but the kids kind of think they come up with it. Um, simple steps, simple guidelines that you would expect kids to do, and the parent signs it, the teacher sign, I sign it, uh, as well as the student. And we just don't have a whole lot of kids. Uh, misusing the technology. Well, actually, we haven't had any, to be quite honest with you. So. And if I could jump in, too. Um, I've um, been talking with teachers all over the country who are, are doing what uh, Dr. Rogers is doing, and I, they're doing very similar things. Um, the survey at the beginning to find out what they have and what they can and can't do drives what you can do in teaching. If everybody is unlimited texting, or most of them do, then you can use that. If they can't make many phone calls, then you, you don't take as much advantage of that. Um, also providing alternatives in their lessons. So for those few students who don't have cell phones, don't want to use them, parents won't let them use them, there's always an alternative to using the cell phone. Um, pairing them in groups also and, and things such as that. Um, one thing that, that works really well for schools, um, and, I, and I think you guys do it, is, is really developing a social contract with the students. So as a teacher sits down and does surveys and talks about digital footprints and mobile safety, and by the way, MTV has the best special I've seen on sex and a great survey for students to take on it and it's a great way for students to relate to other kids who are doing sending nude pictures and finding out what the consequences are for doing things like that um, but they're sitting down with the students and they're making a social contract um, where they develop rules together and they say what do you think is appropriate and inappropriate and I think one of the greatest things about starting to use cell phones in school is that there's actual conversation about appropriate and inappropriate use. When we just have a policy that bans cell phones, there's no conversations going on. And so you're not talking about why you should and shouldn't be doing something and the consequences of it. You're just saying no. But once you open it up, there's more conversations that are happening around it um, so that when things do come up, you feel comfortable talking about it. Um, so, um, you know, they usually set the classroom sets some rules and the students talk about what the consequences are for those rules and breaking the rules. Permission forms are sent home to parents. Um, one teacher told me they did a parent information night because they found a lot of the parents had no idea about mobile safety, <laughs> so they wanted to to inform the parents. Um, you can get the parents more involved too, which is great because they can become part of your text messaging alert system that you're using with the students because they have cell phones, so they can become involved with it too. Um, but one of, I think, the, the most important rules that I've seen that, that have come across in classrooms that are doing this is that they're making the rules um, in some ways based along what 
um, businesses do when they give you a cell phone for your company so that students are kind of mentally ready for that when they move into the working world, which is um, uh, you don't send messages um, unrelated uh, to the classroom environment when you're in the classroom. And if you're going to send a picture of somebody or a video or a message about somebody, you get their permission first before sending it. Um, and that's just good practice and, and um, so that when they are in the real world, they're not just taking a picture of somebody and posting it on the internet without permissions. Uh, I have a question. We, we touched on this in the report. Um, there, because technology changes so quickly and evolves so quickly, it's hard to research it. Um, so with the, with the use of mobile devices, what research exists that shows a pov positive impact on learning? And what type of research do you think needs to be done to better inform educators about the, the potential impact of using these devices for learning? And, and how they should use them? <laughs> it's a big Great. question. <laughs> yeah, no, well, what's interesting is, you know, we've been thinking a lot about research and development, and the bottom line is the, the traditional research way of doing kind of scientifically based research and gathering evidence doesn't work in this field. Because it's, it's the work that's been done in, in a lot of ways is not generalizable over a genre. So what the better thing to do is to think about learning and do the research on learning and the role of engagement and the role of interaction and the role of um, you know, parental um, oversight or the role of good policy development. I mean, so it's more of, a, it's, I think we have to really do generalizable research because what we're finding with the scientifically based research when, you know, some of the, even the work that federal government does, by the time the research comes out, whatever it researched is gone or it's so evolved <laughs> that, you know, even some of the work we're doing on online, online learning, we're learning that people, you know, do well online and in some cases they, they, you know, match the achievement in half the time at half the cost. So, you know, but how do we think about that? So the question in my head is not, okay, so let's do more of whatever that was. It's like, okay, how do we make that thing even better, more interactive, more engaging, better feedback, better interaction, better uh, visualizations? You know, how do we create a, a better, you know, space? So um, it, that's, it, that's not a great answer. Um, but I think that, you know, um, there are some um, organizations that are doing research, and you probably referenced them in here in your 94-page report. Yeah. Not this. Nice. Right. This is beautiful, by the way. Yeah. For the record, yeah. um, if I could jump in, too. Um, these are really small, but it's something, mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> um, I know the University of Coventry in the UK um, has been doing research on literacy and cell phone use with students since about 2004, 2005. Um, so that is a good reference. Um, just very recently they came out um, with a study that uh, the more text messaging students do, the better spellers they are, which sounds <laughs> as though it's completely contradictory. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's because they're using phonics, they're using the phonological language, and you have to know how to spell the word in order to condense it into something of a text message. So they said the younger the students were that received cell phones, um, the more likely they were to be a better speller, and the more they text, the more likely they were to be a better speller. So they have a few other literacy connections that they found with using cell phones that are interesting if you want to check that out. And then there's um, some teacher action research that's happened, um, which is obviously very small scale. Victor Fitzgerald out in Colorado is one person, and you can look at his research on cellu cellular ed Dot com, and um, he has done uh, research for the last two years on using cell phones with 120 some of his own students and found great strides and um, changes from before and after. So that's another study you can look at. Small though. Oh, great. Okay. Go so ahead. So I have a follow-up follow question in there is uh, directed at Karen. You say that, well, the traditional uh, approach of doing the research and finding the information, really it's not there and it's not going to be there. But at the U.S. Department of Education, at uh, all the state departments of education, because of NCLB, we require student achievement, we require to quantify it. So it seems that we're at a loggerhead here. How do we quantify yeah. student achievement when we can't quantify, uh, how do we get show that we need funding for uh, 
technology when we can't show that the technology is affecting the student achievement? Yeah, that's a great question, I don't have, and I don't have a great answer for it. I think it's one of the, the, it's some of the work that we need to do. But I will back up and say, you know, again, the technology plan has many pages of references at the end, so it's not like that's completely void of any kind of research. It's, it's, but it's look, thinking about research a little bit differently. Even this conversation is focused on, you know, pre, you know, these kind of devices. It's really focused on text messaging primarily. And you know, very rapidly, we're moving into devices that have a com complex array of you know applications and um, and environments, really, you know, all sorts of things. So again, with the tech plan, you think about data and you think about assessment and and a student achievement, quantifiable student achievement. Two things: we need to come up with assessments that measure the full range of standards, so it isn't just the the testable currently testable items, that's the first thing. The second thing is coming up with um, data that's much more frequent, you know, frequent feedback. So some of the things that we, we know improve student achievement and man, many of the practices are evidence-based. So, and we can look at the technology, technologies to say, so how do these technologies relate to these evidence-based practices? We know these things help students learn. We know they, it helps them access content, um, understand information. I mean, a lot of the, the, the words that you use in terms of you know, summarizing content, those kinds of things, those are great. How do we use, what are the technology tools that can amplify that learning and that behavior? So that's how I think how we need to think about it rather than saying, okay, there's this new product over here, let's go off and do a study about this particular product. So mm -hmm. I am incredibly interested in generalizable research and the kinds of things that will give us evidence about the kinds of environments that will help students learn and less interested in spending you know, multiple years on a, on a bank of research that will be outdated before it comes out. So I think, I don't know if that clarifies, that's what I was trying to say. And, and, and the whole question of evidence with the Invest in Innovation, you know, I think if you've looked at those grants, there's the different levels of, of evidence as well. So we're really thinking about, you know, what it, how, and, and then also thinking about, are there new ways to define evidence in a technology-rich environment in a fast-moving uh, space, so. And just a, a follow up on that, there's been uh, quite a bit of movement in the area of using uh, mobile tools for doing more so-called personalized or individualized learning. What do you see, and you can all probably uh, address this, what do you see, how do you see mobile tools really being uh, effective in creating a more you know, personalized approach to teaching kids? I'll start, I'll lay it out and then you can totally add on. In the tech plan, we, we, I, we sort of took the tact of defining what is personalized learning, right? And we sort of <coughs> created this, this uh, space that, that individualized learning is, here's the bank of content that everybody in my classroom needs to learn. Everybody's gonna learn it, but they can do it at their own pace, right? So it's kind of thinking about it in an individualized fashion. Differentiated learning then is adding the layer of, and we can differentiate the approach for you because you learn best like this, or this will help you, or you know. So thinking about how to create differentiated uh, methodologies as well. The third being personalized, where yes, it can be individualized and differentiated. And by the way, it's kind of the long tail of learning, right? What are all the kinds of things that you might be interested in as a student that we can leverage to get you hooked into, you know language arts or algebra or you know whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish. So personalized learning with really becomes when you use technology whether and you know these are really computers at this point you know whether whatever they are they're um, the environment that that we have here allows students to connect in with what they're interested in and access content in a variety of, of ways uh, people don't have to be all doing the same thing at the same time, and it allows you to do complex projects online with other people. So it's a, it's an, it's it really you can lay out a vision for a very personalized, um, relevant kind of uh, meaningful environment for each and every student when in fact they're each empowered with their own device. I, I agree, uh, and that's one of the things that we we partnered with the Pearson Foundation and uh, the Mobile Learning Institute, and actually I'll be, be a conference with them tomorrow for a, a project that uh, we're going to pilot two, two seventh grade English classes, and they're going to do a book study on 
uh, the book Mouse, which is a, a graphic novel mm -hmm. uh, that talks about the Holocaust. But one of the, the end products that I'd like to see uh, to encourage kids with thinking and uh, personalized learning or PLNs is a, a platform that may be similar to Twitter. Lots of people don't understand the, uh, the power of Twitter being able to learn from so many different people from all over the all over the world, pretty much, and I think that platform could be put in place for kids as well. Certainly in a safe, closed networking environment, so that you can get flat, what I call kind of flat learning, where based on my interest, I can get individualized instruction, I can get the uh, differentiated instruction, but also personalize it so that uh, it's got importance and meaning to me. And uh, to me, I think that will deepen their level of understanding so that you can get a good understanding of the standards that they need to uh, learn. So I think uh, the mobile tools will allow that to be a little more effective. And I think it will also cross-platform to uh, computers, but the, when you look at the expense of the infrastructure that it costs to maintain uh, hard computers, I think this mobile technology in and of itself uh, will be certainly a more cost-effective approach to making sure that all kids have access. Jean, did you want to add something? Or? I just want to say that um, we sort of skirted a little bit around the issue of professional development for teachers, but um, I think that is a true key because um, teachers, again, teachers are teaching the way they were taught, and it's sometimes very hard to see the potential if you don't try to approach teaching in a different way from what you were taught. So um, we need to, to definitely focus in on that professional development to help teachers get to the point where they can see those possibilities and say, wow, I can do this, um, and, and just open up their minds a little bit and do it effectively. I mean, you know, a lot of teachers say, oh, I'd love to use a cell phone in my classroom, but it's just like the PowerPoints and the smart boards, if they use it in the same old way, it's not going to make any difference. Sure. So I want to repeat something I said earlier, but kind of in this context, because that was that's good. The um, when we think about professional development, that sort of the, some of the tradition, some of the traditional professional development has been to get teachers to learn how to use this stuff in instruction, kind of one way. Right. A lot of time has been spent on this, and we still have the same sentences coming out of our mouth. We got to what are we going to do with teachers? Teachers don't can't don't know how to do this stuff, you know, etc. So I think what teachers can do, and I think all professional development should be 100% focused on not 100%. That's an overstatement. Should be focused on how do we help teachers create compelling assignments for this generation of students? Compelling assignments. Every teacher can figure out how to do that, and then students hey, I got the calculator in my pocket. Can I use the calculator? I got the internet. I can do the research. I got the data. We can, let's go take pictures. Let's do this, you know, crunch, get online in the NOAA and look at the earthquake data. There are so many things. And teachers can kind of roll up their sleeves with students and almost be collaborators, collaborators in learning with them. Mm -hmm. So it's a different, it is a different relationship, but it doesn't stop everything until we have all teachers learning how to do the one thing you know, how do I leverage text messaging or whatever? And could I? Yeah, and quickly? We'll, we'll finish off with you, Liz. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, I think that um, both of these issues that we're talking about, the personalized learning and the professional development, to me, also with mobile technology the way it is and the way it's going, bring up questions to me about the school day itself and changing our school. Our school day is so industrialized and it's, it's you know, from the 1800s and the early 1900s and, you know, why do we have it the way we have it? Why do we have the summers off? And um, so I think that we do need to rethink the school day itself and rethink even, you know, questioning school districts. Like why can't students, if they're not getting what they need from one district, use their mobile device to tap into other school districts and, um, you know, uh, even it goes down, in my opinion, to uh, the assessment question as well of why, why can't students use their mobile devices on their standardized tests and why can't we start to think outside the box a little with that. And Great. Thank you. Thank, yes, you very, <laughs> thank you. very Thank you very much to all the panelists. Very fascinating discussion. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Todd Haken with Common Sense Media, based here in DC, and I just wanted to thank all the panelists from this panel as well as uh, the prior panel. And thank you, Kevin, for moderating. Really appreciate it. Uh, 
you know, we've heard a lot of the pros and the cons uh, of mobile and kids. Um, there's a lot that we still need to figure out. You know, we focus primarily on phones here, but there's a lot about mobile, such as one-to-one -one laptop programs, where you do have direct you know, access to the full screen with the internet. Um, we, we just barely at the end started touching on the important issue of cost. Professional development costs a lot of money because you have to have substitute teachers you, uh, while, they ha while the teachers do professional development. You have maintenance of the technology alone uh, is, is a staggering cost. Um, and while you know, we're cutting budgets in schools just to keep up, these issues are, are going to you know, become more and more. Um, one area that we're certain of, though, is that in order to help kids truly thrive with this technology, we need to help parents as well as educators mitigate some of the concerns, some of the cons. Uh, so we need to help give them the tools, we need to give them the education, and uh, Common Sense hopes that you'll join us in doing that. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, one last thing, if you registered for a State of the Mobile Net, that's gonna be uh, happening right next door in about 20 minutes. Uh, if you didn't register but you're interested, there is on-site registration. Otherwise, thank you very much.